I'm Jeff Yarger. I'm a professor of chemistry, biochemistry, and physics at Arizona State University. I'm Samrat Amin. I'm a staff scientist at the Magnetic Resonance Research Center. And we're here today to uh, introduce calorimetry, which is the main measurement used in thermodynamics uh, to get at you know, experimental details. And, and really, I think of it as just the measure of heat, because in thermodynamics, you're looking, you usually split energy up into two major categories, work, whether it's mechanical work like pressure volume or, or surface tension across an area or force, at, you know, the derivative in a length or electrical, the, you know, magnetic work, uh, et cetera, all get split up into different work terms, but it's almost always thermodynamics is defined uniquely by its heat term which is its temperature into its change in entropy. And it's usually most of thermodynamics is spent trying to understand that heat term, most of it in the entropy uh, part of it. And the one that we grasp onto is all having a familiarity with is the temperature. And it's typically measuring this temperature that we're doing in calorimetry. And we do this, you know, calorimetry can split up into indirect calorimetric things, Metabolism can be followed by just how you inhale oxygen versus exhale CO2, and it can be assumed how much heat and stuff by knowing the metabolic or chemical processes that are going on, and therefore how much heat must be evolved in these systems, how much heat we uh, produce from these effects. And then we're not really talking about that today. What we're really gonna talk about is direct calorimetric measurement or direct measure of temperature, or heat in a system. Um, through calorimeters, as we would call them. And we're going to look at four major component, the major types of calorimeters. And these are the ones you would say most commonly you see in, in chemistry um, or, or biochemistry. Uh, but there are a lot of different calorimeters, solution calorimeters, um, adiabatic calorimeters, uh, meaning you know, defining the walls as not allowing heat through them, etc. But we're gonna to touch on a few that you see very early on, and then we're gonna to get to the ones that I would say get used very often in both research and, and advanced uh, thermodynamic experimental measurement. And uh, um, so these are looking at first isobaric, which means constant pressure calorimeters, isochoric, meaning constant volume, uh, and those are ones that, that often get introduced at a fairly early level. Uh, and so we're just gonna go through those for completeness, but then look at two major types that you see in biochemistry and chemistry. Isothermal titration calorimetry, which we typically just call ITC, um, and differential scanning calorimetry, uh, which really does um, you know, get used, I would say more often than almost any other type of calorimetry for looking at thermodynamics of materials in chemistry, biochemistry, et cetera, some type of DSC. Uh, technique. And so just reminding us on isobaric calorimetry, the reason this gets introduced often very early on, and it's often called styrofoam cup or coffee cup calorimeter, because that's what we use to make things as adiabatic as possible, which is a fancy way of saying that, that you don't really want uh, heat exchange between the surroundings, uh, the outside, and the system uh, that we define as the inside of the um, Thing. And so, uh, and the way I, I like to think of this, thinking of the combined first, second law where this is your heat term, this is your change in heat, and everything else is your change in uh, work, this being mechanical work, and this being a chemical work type term, we usually move to enthalpy, where instead of looking at, at the change in volume, it's the change in pressure, and in isobaric, which means that uh, dp or you know, dp or the change in pressure is zero, this term goes away. If we're not changing the number of moles of anything, you know, so we're not doing any type of chemical work, uh, so we have a fixed system here, we're not adding any material or letting any material out, then the change in enthalpy is just the change in heat of the system. And, and this is usually the conditions uh, that we're working at. And so uh, oftentimes, 
you know, this gets related to just TDS or, or this is related just to entropy. And, and often we're looking at, at, at the heat capacities of the system there. And so this gets used in a, you know, a couple common ways. One is, you know, mixing two things and seeing, you know, uh, where the temperature. So you're almost always just measuring temperature, either with an old style thermometer, or I would say more commonly now, everyone, everyone uses thermocouples, right? You know, why is this here to keep material from going out? Stirring is just, you know, a practical matter of, of being able to make sure the, the heat is homogeneous, that, you, that you're not limited by any thermal conductivity, um, right? But you're not, this isn't really meant to add any mechanical uh, uh, heat into the system. Uh, but it helps if you're mixing solutions or doing something like that. This gets used for common things like you, you know, drop in a piece of metal or something and you want to know its heat capacity and it starts at a temperature and you have something like water in there and you see how much it heats it up and you can back calculate what the heat capacity of, of that substance must have been, mm -hmm. et cetera. Um, so uh, it's this type of coffee cup calorimeter that you almost always see in introductory physics and chemistry and biochemistry uh, text and it's something you can set up at home and easily use. Um, you know, the next one beyond that, that that often gets used especially in chemistry is, is isochoric, which again means constant volume, um, no change in volume. And the reason for this is, is that, um, you know, constant volume uh, calorimeters which directly relate to the internal energy uh, will be directly related to the heat under constant volume and no change in the, um, the chemistry of the system. I think of it as the, the most common use of this is um, what they call bomb calorimetry where you're in a sense just putting a high pressure of oxygen gas in there mm -hmm. to explicitly do a combustion reaction. And because of Hess's law that, it, you know, a combustion reaction, you can then back out what the enthalpy of formations are for whatever you're looking at there. Um, so this is another one that we, you know, have a, uh, you would say is very common that, uh, that people have in, um, at university or in food industry labs or mm -hmm. uh, anywhere where they want to know um, the enthalpy of uh, formation of different types of of anything that would combust, right? So any organic material, et cetera. Yeah. Uh, we have several of these at ASU and you used to be in charge of them, right? Yeah, in the uh, physical chemistry lab. So um, third, fourth year students typically take this class in chemistry and uh, we have about three bomb calorimeters set up. Um, they are about this big in size and so they uh, even just call them I mean almost by default they call them bomb calorimeters. pretty Who much makes, I mean there's really only one company right I think it's par pretty yeah. much that makes most of the bomb calorimeters. they do a lot of hydrothermal stuff as well but they're very yeah. famous for in a sense just making non-corrosive exactly you know yeah. metals like uh, um, I don't even know what they use uh, um, uh, do they use it's not um, on these it, it almost is looks it like Nell uh, I, I don't know yeah, that's a good question. I don't know what the material. I know that stainless steels of some sort, yeah, exactly. but I think of even even you know trying to use ones because under these conditions you can get pretty corrosive. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah, yeah. And you're generating really high pressures. You know that's why they call it. A well, really high. Fire, what are, so. what what kind of pressures are generally? I think of it as you know common at least from what I remember is yeah. kind of in the twenty to thirty atmosphere. Yeah. Range, yeah. right? Like, yeah, you actually pressurize that initially with oxygen as well, right? And then you combust it. So um, I think on the graph here, uh, this is kind of the typical data that you see from it. So um, you end up basically, um, it's a little different than what we saw earlier with the styrofoam cup. In this, you put your sample inside a metal container, um, the bomb, and pressurize it with oxygen. Um, but so then that's you actually this, want right? that like, heat so, to flow out. So yeah. this is the bomb. Yeah. Um, and you're pressurizing it with oxygen in here, mm -hmm. and yeah. like we said, to about 20 or 30 right. atmospheres, right? And then that that this initial thing right here is is initially outside of the container, and you pressurize right. it. But first, you put the material that you're interested in. Yeah, studying. you usually pelletize your material like a little pellet, about you know the size of your thumb, basically. So put it in a pellet. You put it in a little cup, and you basically put two wires in there that are going to heat that material and combust it once it's filled with oxygen. So 
So yeah, that's what so the leads are external. here and here. So you yeah. basically use, in a sense, an electrical exactly, uh, current yeah. to, to basically ignite the bomb or ignite yeah. the oxygen to do the combustion. And, right. and you, you make sure by having 20 or 30 atmospheres over a decent volume, I assume that means you have an excess of oxygen. oxygen right. Uh, yeah, you the, basically purge out all the other gases that are typically in air. So you only have oxygen and excess oxygen there. So, but the difference here is that, you know, unlike that styrofoam cup container, you actually want the heat to flow out from this thing, right? Because you're going to measure that heat. So you, what you do then is um, you basically take this whole assembly and you throw it in a giant water bath. And you accurately measure the amount of water because then you're actually going to measure how much th uh, that water temperature increases. So, but in a sense, I think of it, the way I like to think of this is, is that this part is the bomb calorimeter, mm -hmm. and then the outside is what we just talked about. Yeah, is, exactly. is a coffee cup or a styrofoam cup. I mean, they're That's usually the more sophisticated, part, right. but they're adiabatic, yeah. you know, calorimeters where you, you can't exchange heat in and out of exactly. the system. Yeah. Um, now, it clearly does, or this would be perfectly <laughs> flat, right? Right. Like these would be perfectly flat if, if there was actually no change yeah. in heat, so no change in temperature. But... Um, but for the most part, it's meant to, you know, the, the outside part is meant to act as a isobaric calorimeter. Right. And since you can separate those two components now, anything that happens in here, since you usually calibrate this with something so you know the overall heat capacity mm -hmm. or all the thermodynamics of this outer, in a sense, isobaric calorimeter, right. and that allows you to get kind of to that inner yeah. part, right? And then, you know, I think a few details, like you said, like usually this, this to me implies when you see this data and it's flowing down, this means room temperature is, you know, somewhere down exactly, here, which is yeah. typical 25s, um, you know, usually, you know, 24, 25 is kind of, you know, where you would find room temperature, right? Yeah. Um, so it's kind of, you can see it's not perfectly adiabatic, it's losing. Mm -hmm. And then you probably, I wish they would put exactly where they ignite it. Yeah. But... You know, then you see it, you know, heat up, but then you see it, you know, over time, you can imagine this would eventually go all the way back, back down if you give temperature. it yeah, yeah. Uh, long enough because it's not quite adiabatic. Exactly. And the hardest thing is that you wish it was, if it was perfectly adiabatic, it would go from there, it would increase its temperature and then it would go see like that. Step. And then, yeah, yeah, delta T would be easy to right. measure. In a sense, that's half of what's, you know, makes this experimentally difficult is, is you have to define a very precise yeah. change in temperature when really there's a range of temperatures. Exactly, yeah. yeah. There's a lot of error in the analysis here. And I mean, the other thing is you're not getting a huge change in temperature. I mean, you're using the heat capacity of water in this case, right? And, you know, typical delta T's are two, three degrees. So typically you want to use something like a thermocouple that has, you know, a tenth or a hundredth of a degree resolution in this case, just to give you better better data, more accurate results. Mm -hmm. I've always, you know, been curious about just, you know, like you said, like, you know, what, you know, it seems like a lot of people spend time, like you said, you, you can put more material in here, but mm -hmm. that combusts more, which creates more heat. You don't want to create too much heat though in water because you don't want to get too hot, right? right? Like then it evaporation, yeah. you, you run into issues. Like I would think, you know, looking into what you can, you know, use besides water, Yeah. you know, things with no vapor pressure, um, you know, because uh, these aren't perfectly closed off, yeah. right? Um, yeah. I, I, less, I'm surprised, you know, less water in a sense, right? Then you sure. get more of a, a right. heat effect, yeah. you know. Um, but you, or, yeah, other liquids. I mean, I think the problem there is, right, I mean, anything you put in there, it needs to be safe, it needs to be cheap, right, for most labs. So that's where water just, you know, fits the bill for most of the things there. So, um, I mean, you can literally just go to the tap, get it, and run an experiment, right? So, and you need a good amount for the size of these bombs as well, right? So that's the other problem there. So any other liquid that you use there, you're going to have to get a lot of it, right? So um, one of the things I know um, the industry, I guess, has been working on is uh, miniaturizing those bombs as well. So these days, I think you can get a, a bomb that's probably, I want to say, about, about a fifth of the size of the ones that I mentioned earlier. So you can kind of scale this whole operation down, and then that's where it is a lot easier to use these other liquids there. Hmm. Okay. Uh, and so...
that's kind of an introduction to you know two types of calorimetry I would say most commonly you see at the undergrad level especially in what I would say chemistry mm -hmm. for sure um, but you know ones that sometimes you know you see at the undergrad level but you for sure see when you move up kind of um, research you know level industrial research and, and academic research as well is um, you know especially in the biological sciences is isothermal titration calorimetry has really gotten to be I would say built in in significance and importance over the last 10 or 15 years. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, this really is in a sense of almost what they used to call a drop solution calorimeter. I mean, it's, this isn't an, a new concept at all. In fact, it's a really old one. Oh, yeah. um, geology used to use drop calorimeters all the time, okay. you know. Um, in fact, uh, one that used to be here at ASU, Navratsky, Alex Navratsky, uh, National Academy member, uh, went to Princeton. I, th I think she's UC Davis now, or um, she comes back and visits here every once in a while. Uh, you know, she does. She used to do, and/or still does a lot of drop calorimetry type experiments. This one, though, almost every time you see ITC, the first thing you think of. In fact, it's what I even draw here. You think biology because where this really gets used has really been honed in is they've made these really good adiabatic shielding where and just really good, you know, constant power source, really fine mm -hmm. thermal couples where you can, um, you know, put in, you know, very specific, in a sense, drops or, or, or amounts at a time. You can control the volume that, that, that comes out of these syringes and you can see its heat effect in discrete levels right. and directly get in a sense, you know, the amount of heat or these are done under constant pressure conditions. So enthalpy is yeah. what it's related to. And you can see very small enthalpy changes because, you know, these, you know, in these heat changes between ligand binding of these big macromolecules, the, the common thing here would for the macromolecule to be a protein, mm -hmm. um, you know, with a small ligand or peptide or aptamer or something like that. I mean, these are really small heat effects. Yeah. Um, so nothing you could ever um, uh, see with just kind of a, a really basic setup. You need, you know, a lot of these very finely engineered calorimeters to mm -hmm. be able to see this um, effect. So, uh, but you know, with that said, it's it's really great for for looking at, you know, the binding, you know, which you know the drug industry uses this like crazy right, right? like but um, you know half of you know almost all it's it's critical to a lot of thermodynamic you know biophysical chemistry anytime you're looking at thermodynamics I would say you know this is one of the techniques that yeah. that comes up now this one measures heat directly a lot of people think you know in a sense look at binding stuff indirectly fluorescent probes right. and and stuff like that but the, the real unique thing about calorimetry directly is it's it's not implying indirectly what some heat change is. A lot of people like, for example, what they'll call melting in DNA, you know, where the, uh, the DNA will separate, you know, will, uh, the duplex will come apart. I mean, they, they call it melting, which implies a first order phase transition, which it's not really. But they're also usually looking at it spectroscopically. Yeah. And there's been a lot of data to show this, but this is really measuring the true heat effects right. of these, the thermodynamics yeah. directly. Um, so moving to that, which I would say in the biological realm is a very important calorimetry to one that I would say is globally important across physics, chemistry, biology, geology, mm -hmm. most scientific uh, fields is if somebody said name one calor type of uh, calorimetric technique that, that I should learn, I would say, you know, differential scanning calorimetry. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, I want to say it occupies in current literature way in the over seventy to ninety percent of most calorimetric measurements yeah. are done. I thought even more. Yeah. Yeah. Using DSC, and so DSC is is closely related to DTA, mm -hmm. differential thermal analysis, which I I, I know you'll say a few words because you've been developing right. this, um, but. Uh, differential scanning calorimetry is what I would say is kind of the modern way that people look at, at enthalpies, mm -hmm. um, you know, in materials. So besides just giving you some type of melting uh, point or where the transition happens by scanning through temperature, um, you know, basically the, uh, you know, uh, the integrated 
component uh, of this is is directly related to the enthalpy. Right. Um, yeah. And so I like to show this is just, you know, so when you see a change in, this is in a sense proportional to heat capacity. So when you see a change in heat capacity, like for example, a glass transition, you see this, this is showing that glass uh, from a glass here at low temperature to a super cooled um, liquid. liquid. Uh, and then oftentimes those supercooled liquids are above TG will devitrify, a fancy way of saying crystallize. Um, and so, but the area there gives you, you know, the, the enthalpy. enthalpy of crystallization in yeah. a sense. Um, so the opposite of fusion, but you, you have to keep in mind it's doing it at a temperature that's not maybe at the Gibbs free energy zero. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, so, um, and then this, and then, uh, you can watch that crystal eventually melt. And so this will give you the delta H of melting or the delta H of fusion um, you know, of the system directly. Mm -hmm. uh, and these should be related minus the CPDT across that range. Right. Um, so as some of the common transitions. You can often hermetically seal these and look at boiling as well. Not yeah. as common, but um, you can look at all sorts of, you know, of phase transitions besides glasses and, and melting or crystallization. I mean, you know, lipid type transitions, you know, things that are undergoing solid to solid polymorphic transition. The uh, drug companies look at that a lot right. or pharmaceutical companies. Um, polymorphic stuff, right? I mean, yeah, yeah. exactly. So. Um, and really what this is doing is it, it's still just measuring, in a sense, the main measurement is thermal couples, right? Yeah. Yeah, essentially, I mean, that's kind of what you see sticking out just below the sample and reference here, right? I mean, um, typically, I think most modern DSCs end up just using a big metal plate, which is inherently one of the thermocoupled materials, right? So it provides good thermal conductivity for both the or reference and sample, but then they directly attach the other metal. Oh, sorry. Uh, there we go. <laughs> they directly attach the other metal um, here and it provides thermocouple probes directly under the sam sample and reference pans here. So they're right underneath the pans that you typically use in that DSC. So um, that's why this technique ends up giving you incredible resolution and sensitivity. Right. And, the, and for completeness, I would say there are two types. There are, yeah. there are flow compensated or, or heat flux, mm -hmm. you know, is what I would call it. And then there's power uh -huh. compensated where, so one, in a sense, acts more like a DTA. One mm -hmm. is you, 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 in a sense, your baseline measurement is a difference in temperature right. uh, between the reference and the sample. The other one is trying to keep temperatures the same and adjusting the power yeah. to do that. Yeah, the uh, power compensated literally have little heaters under both the yeah. reference. They work. And sample, I think of them so. as they work like a stove. Yeah, you exactly. Know, that's how yeah. I always say it. Like, there's kind of two ways to heat things: more like your microwave, or more like putting hot air or, or flowing something right. over it, um, which are more how these heat flux ones work. And then there's the more kind of, you know, from the bottom directly heat it like you would, you know, your stove, yeah. right? And those are kind exactly. of the two differences. They end up giving the same measurements. But as you can imagine, like the power compensated often can do much faster scan rates. And yeah, since exactly. you're measuring a flux or, or what you're ultimately measuring is the first derivative, mm -hmm. the change in this, you could, the faster you scan, sometimes with weak transitions, the better you can see it. Exactly. Uh, but the more it spreads it out, I mean, there are some differences there as well. Right. So with that said, though, um, I would say, you know, this really is you know, a modern calorimeter, and we have this available at ASU. Right, in multiple places, actually. So there's a brand new one at the Magnetic Resonance Center that we just obtained a few months ago. And I want to say it's one of the most uh, sensitive calorimeters available on the market right now. For so, DSC. For DSC, yeah. 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 And, so, and, and I would even uh, preface that with saying for a standard DSC, because they make right. what are called now nano... Um, yeah nano DSCs, which, which um, are often much more limited in temperature range and, and sample, but, but are much more sensitive. Yeah, and I think that goes back to biological applications. I mean, you're not scanning three, 400 degrees for most of those materials, but you need a lot of sensitivity for the transitions that you mentioned earlier. Yeah. So, um, yeah. 
And so, uh, you know, one of these, and, and I would say the, the ITC and DSC are what I would say I would expect to see in a common, you know, anyone who needs thermodynamic data and you're, whether you're in industry, a pharmaceutical industry, mm -hmm. a food industry, whether you're in academics and, and doing stuff, those are the two I would expect to see most commonly, some type of DSC and maybe some type of ITC. Right. The one that you don't see as much as differential thermal analysis, but this yeah. is one you've been working on some. Right? Yeah, and I think, you know, going back in history, I think DSC was actually derived from DTA initially. Yeah. Um, so, you know, back when people were first just starting to think about how to measure these transitions and whatnot, DTA was actually invented first, right, as a technique. And, and it's not even really that old. I want to say this yeah. is in the 60s yeah, or so. that sounds like about right. Privilof and other, like there's several famous people kind of in the area, both in Russia uh, and in the U.S. that are, that are in Europe also mm -hmm. that are kind of famous for taking what is just looking at differences in temperature and and in a sense, data analysis, or, or just how you look at that, measuring its heat flux versus its difference in temperature at a constant heat flow. Yeah, right. right. Yeah. Is, yeah, so I mean, you know, DTA and DSCs are very comparable. And I, you, you can actually even get DTA uh, commercial instruments, right? Um, and that goes back to just differences in, and it ultimately matters what you're trying to do, right? DTAs that are commercially available, I think they typically have much, much wider temperature ranges. I think you can and go it's up usually to like hot. You, yeah, right? Yeah. It's usually on the, so, they're meant to go really yeah. high, geology. Exactly. You know, um, but I think the trade off is that you don't have the sensitivity and some of the control that you do maybe in a DSC. Right. So, um, depending on your application. Um, but, you know, I think, as you said, DSC is just the much more common technique. Um, but basically in a DTA, um, you know, you have the same thing. Um, you have a reference and a sample. And for the reference, you typically use something um, that's inert in the range that you're trying to study, right? Um, whereas in a DSC, you'll usually just use like an empty pan for a reference. Um, but in a DTA, then, you know, as you see on the screen here, um, you have a reference and a sample that'll basically just go in some kind of metal block to keep them at the same temperature. You want as little thermal gradients across it. And then just like you do in a DSC, you'll basically scan or ramp that temperature up to a certain um, uh, amount. And you basically watch the temperature difference between your reference and sample. So during some kind of phase transition event, right, um, uh, you'll see a difference in the temperature between your reference and sample depending on whether that's an exothermic or endothermic process. And that temperature difference is what's actually plotted out and um, it's very comparable to the DSC in terms of data. So uh, what you have here is mm -hmm. in a sense um, what would control a DTA. Yeah, right? exactly. So. Um, as you see on the screen there, all you really need to do these measurements are a couple thermal couples and a way to read them out, right? So, do uh, you have them? I mean, are these uh, they're two separate thermal couple measurements? Or are you? Uh, I think doing you can do it either way, of, right? So, uh, typically, what's done is you actually kind of join the two same uh, parts of the thermal couples of two thermal couple pairs, and you turn it into a differential pair. So. But you can do that either hardware, yeah, yeah, or you could just do it. Software you can just measure them both separately and then just yeah. Is there any real advantage out. or disadvantage to doing one or the other? Um, setup might be easier uh, with two completely separate uh, thermal couples. Then do you worry about a, a you have sense offset of issues yeah, offset. and things like that that then you need to correct for right? So that's kind of the problem um, with the in a sense more couple. calibration. Exactly, yeah. Um, but it's totally possible. Um, but, um, you know, all you really need in terms of hardware is uh, a way to read this thermocouple pair then, right? So, um, as you can imagine, right, like if this thermocouple is a little hotter than this one, well, you'd get a, a certain voltage here on this side that's higher than this. And vice versa, right? If this is a little hotter, then you'll have a higher voltage here than this side. So, this difference is what you're actually reading. And, you know, over the last few years, one of the neat things that has happened in science and electronics is that um, there's a lot of development in microcontrollers. So most microcontrollers you see like Arduinos, Raspberry Pis, and whatnot, they usually have some way to either, either they'll have a analog to digital converter on board, 
or they have a very easy way to interface with one. So um, in my hand here, I have an example of a microcontroller. Um, in this one, there's actually about, I want to say, 12 channels for uh, analog to digital converters that can be used. So you can directly feed the signals from these thermocouples into these analog inputs and just measure them as a function of temperature. So all you really need after that is a, a metal block that holds your reference and sample and some kind of uh, heater in there, right? So you can use like a, a heating cartridge. You can literally, you know, put a, a hair dryer on it and heat the whole block. I mean, any way you want to heat it, you can do that. And um, as you're heating it and watching these materials go through that transition, um, this microcontroller will log the differential voltage there, um, you know, on the order of every microsecond even. So, um, so then at the end of the day, you get data that looks basically like what you see on a DSC, where you'll see peaks and little valleys there. For and I think of DSC, you get, you know, I think of three. You usually get time, you know, temperature, and, you know, either heat capacity or heat flow or whatever. It's usually, you know, like heat flow in watts, right? Yeah, or something right. like that. And yeah. so you get basically the same here. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, and I like to think of it as, you know, DSCs are often, you know, in a sense, it's, they all, everything we did just measures a thermocouple, right? Exactly. Like, in a yeah. sense. I mean, unless you're going back to old school thermometers, <laughs> right? Like, whether you're doing, an, you know, a coffee cup or an isobaric right. calorimeter, or whether you're doing, a, you know, a bomb calorimeter, you're still just measuring the, how the water changes temperature. You yep. know, DSC, they're all just measuring thermocouple you know, voltages yeah. in a sense, right? It all comes down to how accurately and, you know, yeah. what kind of sensitivity you can work with. Right? And, and I think what you're doing now is showing that because of the recent developments in what I would call like do-it-yourself mm -hmm. um, electronics, you yeah. computer stuff is spe specifically, like you said, with Raspberry Pis and Arduino's, a lot of people are you know, like build your own little storage thing or, or with an Arduino, like let's do our own little measurements. Like you're going to bring that type of do-it-yourself thing to the calorimetry world yeah. where in a sense you, that's could, the goal. You, you could do it before. I mean, that's what, that's what made coffee cup calorimeters or isobaric so popular right. is they were easy to set up. You can just take an insulating cup and yeah. a thermometer of some sort and, and get some decent measurements. Not only out. that, but they're incredibly inexpensive, right? right? So you look at a typical DSC and that's a seventy, eighty, hundred thousand dollar instrument that you're talking about, right? Well, if you're just looking at enthalpies or onset uh, of uh, melting transitions, that sort of thing, uh, where you don't really need the the sensitivity of a DSC, that's something you can do with a twenty dollar DTA at that yeah. point. Right, so, um, so yeah, really, I mean, this kind of uh, electronics and building your own little DTA device gives everyone accessibility to this type of measurement. Okay. Well, I think that's a, a great way to end this introduction to calorimetry from starting with the simple, getting to what I would call research grade ones where you usually need to go somewhere to do it or, or be in a lab to coming back to these new, you know, these sophisticated calorimeters with some of the new developments in electronics, potentially being able to bring some of that more sophisticated calorimetry back into the portable, do-it-yourself, cheap, you know, arena seems to be, you know, an exciting time to, uh, to be doing uh, experimental thermodynamics and calorimetry. Absolutely. Well, thanks, Samrat. Yeah, thank you.